Hello and welcome to Wrestling at Random. I'm Jeremy Deemer. And I am Adam Summers. And this is season three of the podcast where we take all the streaming content of wrestling via the internet, we dump it into the randomizer, we fire it up, and it could pick anything from any point in time, from any territory, from any country. It's It's got it all out there. And whether it's it's weekly TV or it's a pay-per-view, it, we've got it all in the randomizer. We fired it up, and we we got our first trip to a SummerSlam. We haven't had a SummerSlam yet on the podcast. Yeah, that's right. It's kind of crazy when you think about it through that entire first season that was all pay-per-views or big events. Uh, and then you also have those things being fair game in the bonus content feed via Patreon or Apple Podcasts, which... You'll get into that a little bit later, how people can access that. But yeah, no uh, no SummerSlam as of yet until this week, one of the big four pay-per-views from the WWF. And yeah, it is SummerSlam. It's SummerSlam 1996, which is a show that I have not seen. Uh, we've talked about in previous seasons that uh, 95 was a year where I had started to, with the advent of In Your House, you know, order some WWF pay-per-views with more frequency as a kid, as the uh, the cut rates price for those was, was more palatable to uh, to convince parents who weren't already uh, uh, ready for you to order pay-per-views <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, to have a chance to order. But by 96, I was back firmly entrenched in ordering WCW pay-per-views, uh, had a strict one pay-per-view rule back then in the household so i have I, I did not see SummerSlam 96 live and outside of a few clips here and there i'm i'm pretty sure i've never seen this full show up until the randomizer pulled it yeah SummerSlam 1996 looking at how SummerSlam the pay-per-view came to be in 1987 we got to go all the way back to 87 the wwf put on wrestlemania 3 which was the main event of Hogan and Andre the Giant. They added another pay-per-view that year called the Survivor Series as a way to keep Hogan and Andre going. So they went from one event to two events, and they added a third pay-per-view event to its lineup in August 29th, in fact, August 29th, 1988, Following up WrestleMania 4, they added a pay-per-view to its lineup called SummerSlam, the first in 1988 from Madison Square Garden. Today, we review the eighth SummerSlam event. This one comes to us from the Gund Arena in Cleveland, Ohio. In Which, front of- by the way, we will hear that incessantly here on this show. <laughs> And it's so jarring as I watch this pay-per-view because I'm so used to, uh, you know, like if it's not New York City or Los Angeles or Chicago on WWE shows, a lot of times they won't say where it's at because it's not a big enough city here. Like, I, did the did the city of Cleveland sponsor this show in addition to hosting it? Because Vince McMahon screams about Cleveland all the time. He calls it the new American city over and over again beautiful historic cleveland ohio uh, they talk about the rock and roll hall of fame in cleveland ohio constantly like this is the most place specific broadcast i can ever remember for a wwf pay-per-view it is wild i felt like mr gund of gund arena fame was a <laughs> yes. friend of vince jr here yeah uh, Seventeen thousand fans in attendance for this show and, and uh, I'm guessing this was maybe the opening of this building like two years earlier. Yeah, this is a uh, brand Summerside new 1994 type of building. was yeah. for the United Center. Uh, that may have been part of this, but it, it was, as you said, it was jarring because they usually don't go that go in that hard on the city unless it's one of the uh, the major, major, major cities. But I guess when you're in the new American city of Cleveland, Ohio, you make an exception. Yeah, and they pulled in a great gate of four hundred and thirteen thousand one hundred and sixty eight dollars for this show with seventeen thousand fans, which they weren't always pulling in huge, huge crowds at this point in their history. Uh, this is one of the ebbs in in WWF uh, popularity, uh, and we'll see that, and we'll talk about that just in terms of the reaction to a lot of guys. But uh, there were bodies in the building, that's for sure. 
Yeah, this was, you know, we talked about it in the, uh, before we started recording here. This is in the period of time, 1996, where WWF and WCW are, are they're in a battle. They're in a war here. And uh, WCW had the upper hand. WWF has not, you know, they've got their Bret Hart and their Shawn Michaels, but they haven't found their Stone Cold Steve Austin yet. Well, they do have Bret Hart. They do have Shawn Michaels. They do have Stone Cold Steve Austin. We will only see one of these men in action on this show, by the way, and I am angry about that as we go through. That is true. The Stone Cold Steve Austin wrestled Yokozuna in the dark match for this wow. show. <laughs> wow. Talk about a, a time capsule of a match and bridging two eras of the uh, of the World Wrestling Federation. It, it only went two minutes, and uh, the the rope broke uh ah, i remember that i think so was that on the uh was that not only a dark match but was that like on the free for on the all? free for all yes so yeah. i watched that live because i think I, I watched the pre-show the free for all and then i probably did the scramble vision to listen to it quote unquote uh without paying for it yeah so that was that was the dark match here this show opens with a black and white video with voiceover hyping up the two top matches and this video package couldn't have been more true as this was a two-match show. And uh, they <laughs> well, just both are featuring monsters was the theme of the video. Yeah, it starts with the monsters. They wear many masks. The monster slayers are also very unique. And apparently the Undertaker is not a monster, but he is a monster slayer. Slayer. Mankind is the monster, in fact. And then they, there is a line in this video package that says, direct quote, the Undertaker is the mysterious light in a world of darkness. What? There is <laughs> Not... a moment, even I, and again, I understand there have been times where Undertaker, even in his very ghoulish phase, was a face, but they were pushing him as the mysterious light in a world of darkness. Yeah, not one of their best video packages here. To one of their worst, I would say. This was not effective. This felt like a parody of a TNA pay per view open with an abyss match. Uh, it was it was supposed to seem uh, I don't know ominous and almost biblical in tone. And said it was just it just came off as campy. Uh, oh, get we, ready! Plenty more camp to come. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, Super Size Stridex Pads presents SummerSlam 1996 from beautiful historic Cleveland, Ohio, the new American city, and we see our broadcast team of Jim Ross, Vince McMahon, and Mr. Perfect. I am going to fast forward to the end of the podcast and tell you my favorite part of the show right now. Please do. We have. We have the broadcast crew ringside and they're talking about what's going to happen. Uh, Mr. Perfect is saying he thinks Shawn Michaels will lose the title to Vader. Then a guy in the crowd comes up to the barricade behind Mr. Perfect while all of this is going on, tries to get Mr. Perfect to autograph his program. Perfect looks at the guy, looks at the camera, looks at the guy again, points at the camera to say, I'm on TV, dude. And then just ignores the guy and the guy walks away. Incredible. It was the only thing Mr. Perfect did on this show because on commentary, completely a zero, nothing. Yeah. He yeah. added nothing to this broadcast. I mean, the positive about that is that he didn't detract. I mean, he this wasn't not. a a uh, gorilla monsoon on color commentary stan lane on play-by-play -play situation at least he wasn't screaming for the entire show but yeah he he didn't add much at the broadcast also, as far as the commentary it also whenever you had this setup where vince mcmahon was the play-by-play -play guy and jim ross was basically a color commentator it was always so awkward it was like the commentary version of two wrestlers whose styles don't mix like you'd have a guy coming down to the ring Jim Ross would be giving giving out the guy's height and weight and athletic background and talking about all the strategy of what he needs to do, what he needs to avoid. And then after he'd get done saying that, Vince would just go, ha ha, and then just start talking about some just WWF speak phrase and then go into the match. Like there was no, they, they were talking the entire time, but there was almost no verbal interaction between the two of them. It was very strange. 
No, between a lot of, whoa, look at that, then yeah. Jim Ross would do the heavy lifting and actually explain what was going on. It was uh, with, But Vince would never engage. Like, Vince no. would say something, Ross would explain, and then Vince would act as though none of that happened, and he'd just move on to talking about something else. Like, there was no back and forth at all. No, it felt like you were sitting where Jim Ross was in the middle between you and Vince, and... Jim Ross would just be whispering in your ear this information, and Vince was yes. not a part of this conversation at all. Well, it was just it a felt, conversation between you and Jim Ross. It felt like there were two different broadcast teams. Like there was Vince and a different color guy, ostensibly Mr. Perfect, even though he didn't say much. And then there was Jim Ross doing color commentary with a play-by-play voice that we couldn't hear. And then somehow... Only Jim Ross and Vince McMahon's uh, microphones from these two disparate announce teams actually made it through to the broadcast. It just was a, a very weird feel. Uh, I was not thrilled about that. What I was thrilled about, though, was after Savio Vega comes through this extremely small uh, entrance and uh, the most, uh, uh, the smallest, most gestational uh, Titan Tron you've ever seen, uh, we then hear. Owen Hart's music, yeah. and here comes Owen Hart, and I am so happy. Savio Vega versus Owen Hart in your opener. Owen has a cast on his hand, yeah. and he comes out carrying his Slammy Award, and we are immediately alerted that uh, Owen is faking, still being injured, and only using this cast as a weapon. In the grand tradition of Bob Orton, Barry Windham, men that got their arms or their hands broken and then kept taping it up or having it in a cast for months, if not years later. Uh, Owen is just tremendous here. You'll be shocked to know Owen Hart, highly entertaining performer. So good on this. Uh, no Jim Cornette, who's the manager of Owen Hart. He's been sequestered all day with Vader in the back. We, we see throughout the show, including here, these hilarious, uh, unintentionally hilarious insets of like, vader lifting things and jim or uh jim Cornette just going crazy as though uh vader had just won the stanley cup the world series the super bowl and the nba finals all at once it, it was uh it was good stuff savio goes after the cast a few times and savio starts working over the arm of owen he misses an elbow drop and owen misses a cast shot and this is where we get our first split screen inset seeing yes. Cornette in the locker room with Vader. Yes. Then we, Savio continues to lift over, or uh, well, I guess he does lift Owen over his head, uh, but he continues to work over the arm, lift Owen high into the air by the arm and back down to the mat. One of those <laughs> Owen's spots. screaming, my arm, my <laughs> arm. <laughs> That's comically. This, this was Owen doing like his ridiculous over the top house, house show shtick. But here in a uh, in a regular storyline, just uh, great stuff. Owen yeah, Owen's one of those guys that like you watch you watch you know the match with Brett from WrestleMania ten. You watch some of his New Japan stuff, and he's just such a great wrestler, so fluid, uh, great high flyer for his size and time, so technically sound, but also just great comedic timing, which is you know in, in some ways almost uh, maybe it's a weird comparison, but kind of Kurt Angle esque. Yeah, so good here. Savio rolls up Owen, but Owen kicks out, sending Savio shoulder first into the post in the corner. And Owen then goes to work on Savio's arm. Armbar takedown by Owen for a two count. I love how the crowd is completely rallying behind Owen in this match. Yes. Like it's not all 17,000 plus people, but. Pretty much nobody is cheering for Savio, and I'd say there's a good three to 4,000 people here who are vociferously in support of Owen Hart. One other weird thing, just from a, a technical note, in this match, when referee Tim White is counting, the sound when his hand hits the mat is so weird. It, it reminds me of, and this is something that nobody other than you and I uh, will be able to relate to. So great thing to bring up on a podcast, I know. <laughs> but when we went to uh, the AEW Rampage show that had CM Punk's uh, return to pro wrestling. Uh, remember that weird sound? Every time someone took a bump and it sounded like, uh, I don't know, like the loudest thunderstorm you've ever heard. Yes. This is what it was like, just this weird, loud, echoey, uh, I don't know, just hollow sound. They, they got it worked out, but it was really distracting in this match. 
yeah, I don't know if that was trying to mic the really hard ring of the the WWF at the time, but uh, yeah, that it, it was noticeable. Um, Clip that and play that here on the podcast. <laughs> Owen ties Savio's arm in the rope. He slaps Savio in the face. Savio got loose, but Owen right back to the arm on the attack until Clarence Mason, the attorney for Camp Cornette, makes his way on the entranceway here. Another character that I had completely forgotten about from this time period in the WWF, Clarence Mason, and the story here, and we'll see it play out throughout the uh, throughout the show, is that Clarence Mason uh, may be trying to poach the non Vader members of Camp Cornette as they are they are frustrated uh, by Cornette as we mentioned earlier, not paying enough attention to them uh, as he's attempting to secure the WWF Championship with Vader. Insiguri by Owen for two. Owen to the buckle and Savio charges. Eats a huge knee to the face. Owen then rolls him up, feet on the ropes, still can only get a two count. A spinning heel kick by Owen to again. Savio goes to the corner. Owen charges in, and Savio clotheslines him with his leg. It was, yeah, like, this, it was, this was literally a, like a leg clothesline. Yeah, it was a it, it was a spin kick that landed in in, like you said, kind of a leg clothesline type position, almost like the way. Uh, the uh, the Booker T arm ringer into the standing sidekick would hit, but this is just a guy running into another guy in the corner getting hit by a leg in that uh, in that position. Uh, we should note at this point the action in this match is very good. The announcers are barely paying attention to it, but Owen is just tremendous here. Savio Vega, as we've talked about before, uh, in the right situations, a very underrated wrestler. Uh, if you haven't heard our review of the In Your House show from, I believe it was from 1996 as well. Yeah, Beware of Dog. Yes, where uh, where Savio Vega and Stone Cold Steve Austin, a very early version of Stone Cold Steve Austin in the WWF, have one of, if not the the best leather strap matches you've ever seen in your life. Savio with a 15 punch in the corner. <laughs> As one does the 15 punch in the corner. Sidewalk slam by Savio for two. Well, this is the first Vince McMahon. He got him. He got him. He got him. No, oh, no, he didn't. Savio puts his head down for a backdrop and Owen hits a neck breaker. He goes to the top and hits a missile drop kick. Still only a two count. Yes. A beautiful top rope drop kick by Owen Hart. And I should mention, Go back to when I said the Vince, he got him, he got him, he got him. I'm not saying that's the first time Vince ever did that because God <laughs> knows it wasn't. It was the first of many here on this particular SummerSlam 1996. Owen to the top, gets crotched by Savio. Belly to back suplex off the top, but the back of Savio's head hits Owen's cast on yeah. the landing of the suplex. Yeah, this was one of those things where you didn't see it when it first happened. Jim Ross was Jim Ross was right there making it. Yep. Eventually, we see the the replay, and yes, they did pull that off. But it's not something that you would notice as you're first watching it. Then Owen Hart takes his cast off, waffles Savio Vega with it. The ref somehow completely misses it, even though he's looking right at it. Uh, Owen then puts the sharpshooter on an unconscious Savio Vega to a big pop from the crowd. Uh, gets the I don't know if it's the submission or really I just think it's the ref calling it because he's out uh, and yeah the crowd loves Owen Hart defeating Savio Vega here 13 minutes 23 seconds fun opener and uh, we we haven't had enough Owen Hart on this podcast no. randomizer get us some more no uh, we have not I agree hopefully we will get more in season three uh, perfect and JR actually did have a great exchange here at the end where uh, perfect says you have to love Owen Hart and JR just says why i was amused if nothing else justin hawk bradshaw with dutch mantel come out and they attack savio as he's heading up the ramp to the back yeah bradshaw comes out he's with dutch mantel as uh is it was he uncle zebediah then or he was whatever he was they started saying vaguely racist things about puerto rico then uh, Bradshaw lariat Savio from behind in the entranceway. And this is where they mentioned that I think it was on the, on superstars or on raw last week. It was Savio Vega 
and Freddie Joe Floyd, <laughs> the, the uh, short-lived character run for Tracy Smothers at this point in the WWF. It was Savio Vega and Freddie Joe Floyd versus Justin Hawk Bradshaw and Zeb, Zebediah, Dutch Mantel, a real match that happened in the World Wrestling Federation in 1996. Uh, we then go from, from that mind-blowing note to the boiler room. Todd Pettengill was still in the WWF in 1996. And in full, perfect Todd Pettengill voice and verbiage, he says, it's freaky in here. He says, quote, it's ominous and there are things in here. <laughs> things thanks, in here. Thanks, Todd. <laughs> yes, we now know exactly what these two men are facing. Apparently... To win the boiler boiler room brawl, you have to get the urn, which will be in the ring. So this match is, it is a race of sorts. The first thing I thought is that I didn't realize how much uh, the Vampiro Sting graveyard match uh, from Bash of the Beach 2000 was an homage to the boiler room brawl. Ah. You start the back and you got to race your way to the ring. Todd finds mankind. He says he's home and he mankind licks a gross pipe. That was <laughs> disgusting, but a solid promo from mankind. Mick Foley as always. Yes. And then as things do several times throughout the, the course of summer, 1996, it falls off a cliff oh. as what do we have before us? A four team elimination match for the world wrestling federation tag team titles. And I don't know if I can't remember whether I texted this to you in reality, or if I just sent the text in my brain, and I didn't actually push send, but my thought immediately as these teams came out was had there ever been a lower point in the history of the world wrestling federation tag team division as the four teams that will comprise that will make up uh, this match and will battle for the tag team championships, which by the way, are still the beautiful belts from the late eighties and early nineties. Uh, great, great title belts. They are the new rockers, Marty Jannetty. I'm sorry. No You're wrong. It's the new and improved rockers. Yes. How could I, how could I get that wrong? It is the new and improved rockers. It is Marty Jannetty sans knee pads or wrist tape, by the way, a terrible look. And his partner, Leaf Cassidy, who uh, is, L snow. That's team Future number one. L snow. Yes. Leaf team Cassidy. number one, just uh less than a year from L snow being the hottest thing in ECW <laughs> with head here. He is leaf Cassidy. Uh, I guess it's better than what was that mass gimmick that he briefly had where they basically ripped off Hayabusa's look and gave L snow a mask. This is going to drive me crazy. You're going to have to look this up, Ooh. but uh, regardless here, he is leaf Cassidy. That's team number one. Team number two is high-fiving babyface duo of Skip and Zip, the Body Donnas. Do you yeah. have any recollection of them being babyfaces? <laughs> of the babyface run of Skip, Chris Candido, and Zip, Dr. Tom Pritchard, without Sonny as babyfaces. This is impossible to believe, but it is real. Um, Next. Wait, uh, the Al Snow masked gimmick shinobi shinobi which I, I wonder if they had to get rid of that bit because that was a great sega genesis game uh and maybe there was a copyright infringement but oh yes the, yeah and uh also uh avatar yes that's the one i remember yeah, was so, avatar yep that so was he had avatar he had a lot was, of them <laughs> avatar was the one that was the uh the Hayabusa gear ripoff, but yes, in any event, Shinobi was the ninja assassin hired by yes. Jim Cornette to dispose yes, of Smoky Shinobi. Mountain. That yeah. is that is correct. Uh, probably not even as good of a ninja as Paul E. Dangerously <laughs> in 1992 in WCW. But we digress. We're trying to think about anything and talk anything about anything more interesting than this. Uh, <laughs> yes, the, the new rockers, the babyface Skip and Zip Body Donnas. Who are, of, uh, of course, Chris Candido and Dr. Tom Pritchard. Yes, and Dr. Tom Pritchard with a buzz cut bleach blonde, which is certainly a look if you've never seen it for him. The Godwins with Hillbilly Jim. With the most generic bluegrass music you've ever heard, which the second that hits the PA, Vince McMahon yells, Sue-wee! 
and here come the Godwins and Hillbilly Jim. How did Jim. they not come out with Hillbilly Jim's song? Don't go yeah. messing with a country boy. That's a that's a classic. How do they not have it? This is the new generation, Jeremy. We don't do those sorts <laughs> of things. Uh, I note that here come the Godwins, here come Hilly, Hillbilly Jim, and I am in hell. Uh, so it, the great thing to note about this, by the way, is these are just three awful teams in their own right, whether they be bad wrestlers or or uh, on the wrong side of the fence, whatever you want to say. And God bless them. Jim Ross is talking about their stats and their strengths and weaknesses as they each come out. And I, I just, I could not care. Then here come the, t- the champions. Billy, Billy and Bart, the smoking guns. They are heels and they are managed by Sonny. They are Sonny turning on the body Donna's and joining the smoking guns. Uh... I will have thoughts about the smoking guns <laughs> in this match. Because you have never seen a team where one guy is just on fire great in a match (laughs) and another guy is just a collection of water and cells and air taking up space in jeans. Uh, It is it is definitely noticeable. And and again, just it's so strange because you have one team, the body Donna's skip and zip that are 100 percent heels miscast as faces. And then you have the smoking guns who are 100% baby faces here, terribly miscast as heels. One thing to notice with the body Donna's is skip is wearing a neck brace. Yes. Uh, Chris Candido skip. He suffered a cracked vertebrae in his neck in a freak accident at the August 9th, 1996 Madison square garden show. The injury occurred when skip was taking a sidewinder slam which is uh, it's something he did on a regular basis, but well, yeah, it's the uh, it's the smoking guns move where they have the uh, it's a side slam like a spinning side slam uh, from Bart as Billy jumps up and hits a leg drop. Yeah, he was taken to the hospital after the show, was put in a neck brace, and he had fractured his fifth cervical vertebrae, and the doctors also found two fractured lumbar vertebrae that he'd been working with for a few months and didn't even know about. I'm sure those very gentle, soft WWF rings certainly helped that out. So he w- had a legit broken neck here. So he but never he was, got the in. Doctors, the doctors cleared him. They to cleared him. <laughs> is what Vince McMahon says here. And I feel like they may have been a little too honest here on commentary about that. Uh, but yeah, the, the match itself starts uh, Billy Gunn and Hog Henry O. Godwin uh, start. And Vince McMahon goes on this diatribe about how quick the Godwins are. What? So weird. Uh, so By zip- the way, I have to mention, as I always do, Godwins, much better in WCW as Tex Slazinger and Shanghai Pierce. Zip from the body Donnas and one of the Goodwins are in and they tag in both the smoking guns i wish the good wins whoever those jobbers are were in this <laughs> match instead of the god win. So, can you notice by the way how much we're trying to not talk about this match yes yeah, so, so so they they so zip and one of the godwins tag in both the smoking guns and the guns are standing in the ring and they can't tag out nobody will let them tag out and we're told they must make contact but they don't and then Bart tags out to zip. This was a weird and horrible exchange. They, was, like it, the commentators are ranting about how they must make contact, and then they never make contact. I don't know what's happening. It was so dumb. First, just the logic of making contact. Does that mean they have to try to defeat each other? Does that mean they can just like high five and then they go back out? But like it's, they're building to this. The commentary, like you said, they're, they're screaming about this. And then Bart just tags in Zip. And this whole weird interlude in this match is just over. And we got Zip and Marty Jannetty doing moves. Yeah, Zip in control, off the ropes. But Marty Jannetty from the outside trips Zip. Billy covers him, gets a three count. Body Donnas are eliminated. Yeah, so very early in the match, again, as you mentioned, uh, skip Chris Candido in the neck brace does not take any bumps, uh, which is totally fine. Yeah. Uh, he should, that's uh, he should not have been cleared by the doctors. <laughs> he should not have been out there at all. Um, so now they're gone and 
Henry Godwin and Billy Gunn are in the ring, uh, but then Leaf Cassidy hits one of them with a shot to the back. Can you tell my notes or detail? <laughs> uh, so uh, Leaf from the outside accidentally clotheslines Billy Gunn. Uh, one of the Godwins tries to pin Billy, but the Rockers try to break it up. But they ended up dropping a double elbow on Billy, so that short-lived alliance is over. Leif in with the Godwins again. He sends him into the corner. Janetti from the outside hits him as Leif rolls him up, and they only get a two count. As the kickout happens, he kicks out, and he sends... Leaf into Janetti, who then flips over the top rope into the ring, where Henry Godwin grabs him, hits the slop drop for the pin. This was like the equivalent of some of the bad lucha on that WCW Festival Day <laughs> Lucha show. Like it just uh it's just bad. This is so, bad professional. Speaking wrestling. of bad, Bart and Henry are both down, right? They're they're in the ring, they're both down. It looks like there's going to be a hot tag. <laughs> but no, Bart just starts beating up Henry again, and it was boring and awful. Bart Gunn was horrible in this match. <laughs> Terrible. I don't know what was going on in his life. I, I have no idea, but he was just awful. Meanwhile, Billy Gunn, who first he it's also noteworthy, he has a cast on his arm as well. But the announcers just, don't talk uh, about yeah, this at all. It, no, it's more for a, th a thumb injury that he had. Uh, Regardless, it's yeah. all wrapped <laughs> in a hard wrap. It's, it's a cast. I don't care if it's a thumb, uh, a forefinger, whatever it is. It, it, it's uh, it's uh, it, it just doesn't get any, uh, any note. Uh, Perfect at one point calls the Godwins the hogs. And I just I cackled because I'm like, yeah, I putting, you're putting as much effort into this Kurt as I am. Uh, this match has completely died. And finally Bart tags in Billy and my God, Billy gun is just a lightning bolt of electricity here compared to Bart gun. He both on the floor at various points in this match. And then in the ring, it feels as though his character is saying things in a very angry voice, but the things he's saying are incredibly lame. And that makes it <laughs> funny. He's like, he says, come on, Henry, do something. You big sissy. And these are the type of insults that Billy Gunn uh, throws out through this entire show. And it just, it makes me very happy. Phineas finally tags in and he runs wild on the guns. Henry and Bart are on the outside. Phineas hits the slop drop, goes for the cover, but Bart comes off the top, nails Phineas, puts Billy on top for the three count. Still tag team champions are the smoking guns. How long do you think this match went? One hour and 38 minutes. It felt no less than that, but it was actually 12 minutes and eight seconds. <laughs> this was shorter than the opener. Jesus, it was that, that is... It, it felt so long, especially that that heat segment with the guns beating up one of the Godwins forever. It was so boring and so horrible. Only twelve minutes. Hoping, I don't know how. I was. It really would have been even more fitting if that heat segment would have been on Marty Jannetty. Just <laughs> memories of that nineteen eighty seven AWA, AWA show, the unending heat segment in that tag team match on Marty Jannetty. Uh, Billy Gunn had a couple other great moments where right before he goes for a corner splash he just stops and screams this is why i am the best which just that that popped me and then at the end when they win he follows up on that by saying we are the best and you gotta like it he screams sunny grabs a mic after the match she tells the women to look at what real men look like look at the woman next to you she says she'll make the building look a lot better by rolling out a huge sunny poster. Now, this huge banner photo of Sunny is hanging there, and she's wearing significantly more <laughs> clothing in the picture than she's exactly, wearing in person in the ring. It's exactly my notes as well. I'm like, why did they do this this way? The big reveal <laughs> is revealing a lot less than the actual in person. It's just like, I remember back in the day when they would do like bikini competitions on wrestling shows, like, and then the rest of the, they would come out and that would be significantly more gear than their actual wrestling gear was significantly more clothing. <laughs> this was just, 
it was funny. It was one of those only in wrestling things. Then we go, we go directly to that. We go from that, I should say, to Vince McMahon sitting at the commentary desk, but he's on the house mic. And he says, everyone in the arena is a superstar. Then we go to this, this pre-tape package of Todd Pettengill talking about all the events that happened in Cleveland. And so one of the events that happened, which happened obviously before this tag match that we just saw, but now we're seeing it after is the Godwins and the smoking guns racing each other horse versus rapid transit. And the winner gets a trophy. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so the Godwins obviously got there first because they took a train. This was incredibly lame. And this was basically a commercial for Cleveland Rapid Transit. Yes. Uh, Not a very effective one, by the way. No. And then we see Jerry the King Lawler at the at the Indians game. Uh, superstars painted over some graffiti in a neighborhood. The only purpose this served, and I think it's really the only reason they did this, was to show Sonny in three additional different outfits. <laughs> Agreed. The only yeah. thing I can figure as to why they did this. Undertaker and Paul Bearer gave away a funeral? <laughs> Okay, I want more <laughs> details on this. <laughs> uh, the video package ends. We go back to the arena where the next match is the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith. No Jim Cornette again. He's still with Vader. Taking on Psycho Sid. We have Babyface uh, Sid Vicious. And can we <laughs> can we talk about this character for a moment? He gets interviewed by Doc Hendricks. Uh, the interview is Doc nothing. P.S. Hendricks. Yes, Michael Hayes as a Doc Hendricks because, you know, when you have Michael Hayes, the best thing to do is repackage him because he wasn't charismatic enough, apparently. But regardless, Sid comes to the ring. He's got his great psycho music. The crowd's into it. He starts, he's all weird and smiley as he comes out. He's cutting a promo to himself. He's fist bumping with the fans. I, again, it's. I note that it's so weird to hear Jim Ross doing this real sports analysis of such a ludicrous product uh, as what is being given to us this evening. As the match is about to start, Vince McMahon says, Sid is legitimately one of the nicest gentlemen you'll ever want to meet. So weird. why are they killing his aura between so weird. him? Like making these goofy faces as he comes out. And then Vince McMahon talking about how nice psycho Sid is. What is this? Match opens with Bulldog trying some shoulder blocks, but Sid doesn't budge. Sid with a clothesline and a slam. Bulldog bails outside. And the, this is get... the point where I notice just how popular Psycho Sid is. He's way more popular than you think listening to this podcast. It's crazy. Always think back to just a couple of years later how popular he was when he made his, his very brief run. I don't think without ever even having an actual in-ring match, but his brief run in ECW. Sid was over no matter where he went, no matter what he did. I'm sure even uh, during the springtime when he'd battle and play softball, whatever. Crowds loved him. But again, this this presentation of him, he's doing side headlock takeovers. He yeah. tips up. <laughs> it's so strange. Meanwhile, meanwhile. Jim Ross is talking about that he wonders what the UK fans think of the British Bulldog right now. Vince immediately jumps in and says, well, I think fans all around the world are all the same. Yes, he does. <laughs> and Bulldog hits a delayed vertical suplex. This was this impressive was strength. Super impressive. And then we get Clarence Mason at ringside again, continuing the story of him trying to poach Jim Cornette clients. Bulldog clothesline Sid up and over the top to the floor. We get another split screen inset with Cornette still in Vader's locker room. Vader's got to be blown up by now. I am concerned <laughs> about his cardio going into the main event uh, against Shawn Michaels. He has been shadow boxing for approximately 51 minutes by this point. We then we, we cut back to the ring and the most terrifying spot of the evening. Oh my occurs. gosh, this is brutal. The British Bulldog. He goes for an, an outside in suplex. He's on the inside. Uh, Sid is on the apron. He picks him up like he's going to suplex him back in the ring. Instead, he drops the six foot eight Sid directly stomach first over the ropes. But keep in mind the word I use the ropes. These are not steel cables like in WCW. They are rope. And when you hit them, particularly when it's a lot of weight hitting him, they drop. 
the ropes drop so hard that Sid's head bounces directly off the mat. It's as though he got like brain bustered by gravity. Terrifying. This was brutal because he got it on the head, but he, he also on the stomach. That was just he he came down far and hard, and this yeah was an absolutely terrifying spot. Um, Sid, I expected his body to just be split in half by this rope he hit so hard. This is bad, brutal. Sid, he's okay. He's back in control. Sends Bulldog to the corner. Hits an avalanche. He missed the second one. Bulldog hits his power slam, but Cornette comes out finally, and he's arguing with Clarence Mason outside. This distracts the British Bulldog. Bulldog tries another power slam, but Sid counters into a choke slam. We get a power bomb by Sid. He gets the three count, six minutes, 24 seconds. Yeah, this was not much. Uh, you know, I think back to. Sid and Davy Boy Smith being on opposite sides of uh, a tag team match, the main event of Beach Blast 1993, uh, with it being Sting and Davy Boy Smith against Vader and Sid Vicious with those hilariously over the top uh, movie vignettes <laughs> on with, the beach. Uh, Harley Race, <laughs> Vader, and Sid threatening to blow up the boat that had uh, had Sting, Davy Boy Smith, and a bunch of little stingers. Um, uh, in every way, shape, and form, this was not that. This was not, in fact, a main event. <laughs> no. What uh, about after this, by the way, this commercial for In Your House Mind Games with a bunch of aliens, like Grays, on the couch with fans watching wrestling? It, it, was, it was nothing. Uh, it, it's just like, make me a generic commercial that I could plug in for anything. In uh, 1996, particularly. Yeah. Gold Dust with Marlena, who's Terry Runnels, uh, versus the Wild Man Mark Merrow with Sable. Which, by the way, the Wild Man Mark Merrow, if you're wondering who this is, it's Johnny B. Bad. If you're wondering what the character is, it's Johnny B. Bad without any of the charisma. The charisma, the flamboyance, none of this. None of it. No. He has the same look. He does all the same moves. But he has no bad blaster. He's just the most <laughs> generic dude you've ever seen. And a couple things here I note, man, again, it's so weird to hear Jim Ross doing real sports analysis of gold dust leverage advantage here in this match. And then Vince McMahon, he sounds so bored during this match. The only comparison I can make is to how he sounded in a couple of those backstage segments as Mr. McMahon on that episode of Sunday Night Heat from season two of this podcast. Uh, you could tell that Vince McMahon knew there were problems with their product. You could you could sense that he was feeling that as he was watching and calling this. Todd Pettengill tells us that Goldust is infatuated with Sable. We see a clip from Superstars where apparently Mankind is also infatuated with Sable. He was out there calling her mommy, freaking her out. She's not a great actress, by the way. No, no. She has uh, one, like one scared thing that she does, and it's so over the top for the situation, and she does it here, she does it later in the match, and it's you cannot take anything that's happening seriously while she's attempting to emote. Mero says he doesn't understand the head games, which is quite a defense to head games. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> just don't understand him, and you're you're aces. <laughs> I, got, I got it. Why? Did, so Vince McMahon again? He just sounds like he doesn't care about this at all. Uh, Mark Miro and Sable come out, and his description of them is they are very special in and out of the ring. Yes, Vince tells us they're special people. <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> so they're 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 hanging out with Sid, doing good deeds. Apparently, <laughs> that's that's what's going on. They're they're helping uh, cover up the graffiti in the New American City. Uh, JR says that Mark Miro told him that he has a new move called the wild thing. He doesn't know what it is, meaning Jim Ross doesn't know what it is, but we'll know it when we see it. Uh, I like know when I, see, <laughs> when I see Sable and Miro in the ring, for some reason, they're like ballroom dancing. Was that part of their gimmick? I, these are not fully baked characters. The match starts with a slap in the face by Goldust. Miro with some arm drags. 
JR at this point wishes Ahmed Johnson a speedy recovery. We'll get to yes. him later. Yes, uh, a horrifying injury oh. and maybe even a more horrifying gimmick for the person who <laughs> injured him. Uh, we'll we'll get to that <laughs> we'll get later. Uh, I, I also love Vince here. As, as he's talking about uh, Ahmed Johnson's injury. He says, in the most bored voice you've ever heard in your life, hopefully they will not have to take the kidney. <laughs> Thanks, Vince. <laughs> So Marrow's working over the arm, and this crowd is not interested in this match, much like Vince McMahon himself. Marrow charges in. Goldust backdrops Marrow over the top to the floor, missing the apron, it looked like, and just landed hard on the floor. Yeah, then he lands even harder. He's on the apron. Dustin hits him with an, or excuse me, gold dust. I'm trying to transition him into being Dustin Rhodes as I want him to be. Uh, he hits an awesome running forearm to the back that knocks Miro off the apron hard into the rail. Uh, gold dust follows that up with a hot shot railing style on the floor. Uh, then they get back in the ring. Gold dust, a, a probably the weakest clothesline I've ever seen him throw. And then here comes mankind from the boiler room. Sable sees him. She has, ample room to get away what does she do instead she sits there stops like pauses herself it's as though someone unplugged her controller and she just keeps screaming no no as if she can't just get away yeah mankind screaming mommy he yells as he stalks sable outside the ring Meanwhile, Goldust and Miro, they're just doing wrestling moves yeah. in the ring as this is happening. It's just so ridiculous. Referees come out, and Mankind turns around and runs to the back and just leaves. He doesn't come back. He's gone. We'll see him again later in the Boiler Room match. What? What is this? <laughs> it, just, it only took referees to get the crazy man out of here. Okay. <laughs> Miro then, off the middle rope, hits a back elbow. He fights back with punches and a clothesline, knee lift. We get five punches in the corner. Then Goldust grabs Mero, and it looks like he's going to spin him around and put Mero seated on the top rope. But in the middle of the rope instead, Goldust just dumps him over the top, and Mero pulls him over with him, and it, it was it looked weird and reckless. Yeah, yeah, it was that that spot where like Miro basically hooks his feet in the armpits and goes flying over and takes him. Where it, yeah, it did not look good. Um, there are men who can pull this off well. I've seen Rey Mysterio pull this off. Uh, <laughs> Wild Man Mark Miro in 1996 was in fact not Rey Mysterio in 1996. He does, however, hit a nice somersault tope, then back inside with an outside in leg drop. Um, this is where he then ascends the ropes. And we learn, to almost tragic consequences, what the wild thing is. He does a terrifying shooting star press, and Jim Ross calls it a shooting star press and goes, oh, I guess this is the wild thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, this was, it was so close to the Brock Lesnar shooting star press as far as the end result. He got uh, several millimeters at most additional rotation as compared to Brock Lesnar uh, which you can go back and listen to part two of our WrestleMania. Was that 17, 19 18? WrestleMania 19, but there don't listen go. to part two, unless you listen to part one. Uh, <laughs> I have don't be one of those people. I have bad news for you, Jeremy, by the way, on that front of part one and part two and downloads, <laughs> you'll be unhappy to know that if you're listening in linear fashion, people, and you know about our, our ring of honor, uh, final battle, 2008, uh, part one and part two that we did several weeks ago, uh, part two, uh, has an even bigger gap between that and part How? one How? than WrestleMania 19 did. Who are these savages that listen to part two and not part one? I don't get it. Oh, unbelievable. Good. Oh. <laughs> they're the same type of people who would try to do a shooting star press when they're clearly not capable of it. <laughs> I think Mark Miro is a part two guy. Marlena distracts the ref and Goldust kicks out. We then get a quick power slam by Goldust. Only two. He then goes for the curtain call and gets the pin. Yeah, this match was not good. I think my favorite thing about this was Miro only doing the uh, the five punches in the corner in this match as if he watched Savio Vega earlier do 15 
and figured we have to get to the round <laughs> number of 20 between these two matches. So I'll take five off the top. So Goldust, he's talking to Sable now, being creepy, and she's screaming for Mark as Goldust then grabs her, goes to kiss her, and Mero beats him up, drop kicks him out of the ring, hits Goldust one more time as he's going up the entryway. 11 minutes, one second. My takeaway from this post-match is you you use the phrase Kirkland's version a lot. This was the Dollar Tree version of Jake and Savage and oh, Elizabeth. Oh, not even. No, <laughs> they're not Tuesday even. Night Texas show no. that we reviewed over on the Patreon. That's kind of what they were going for here, but it's insulting to the, to the good names of Elizabeth, uh, Randy Savage, and Jake the Snake Roberts even mention it in the no, same no, uh, in the same conversation. They're not in the same league. They're not in the same ballpark. They're not even playing the same game. This is those are two totally different things. This was this was not good. That is all time greatness stuff. But uh, we see Ahmed Johnson getting attacked by Farouk, and we hear that Ahmed has a ruptured kidney. This he's is in a red robe, which is amazing, by the way, as he's backstage or, or in his hospital, wherever he is. Yeah, this kidney injury is legit. This actually oh. did happen to Ahmed. Um, it didn't happen at the hands of Farouk. That was a uh, storyline explanation for it. And Gorilla Monsoon, the president of the World Wrestling Federation, stripped Ahmed of the Intercontinental title due to his injury. Can we talk about who is interviewing Ahmed here from his home or the hospital? As Ahmed says that he completely understands why this happened and he's okay with being stripped of the title, which is interesting. We see this split second shot of a embryonically young Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly, yes. Interviewing Ahmed Johnson. (laughs) I I was not expecting to see that. I had uh, kind of forgotten about Kevin Kelly's run at this point. Uh, We then see Ahmed Johnson's nurse who says casually that he may be able to come back in three or four months, but if they have to take the kidney, as Finn said earlier, <laughs> His he won't over. be able to come back at all. Then so we learned- they, they cut to this woman and it just says Pam. And I'm like, <laughs> and, and she looked like Pam from the office. <laughs> and, and then she it's like, oh, look like Pam from the office. It's Pam, not, the nurse. I got do it. Do not okay. insult uh, <laughs> Pam uh, by saying this looked like so, Pam from the office. But, so yeah, uh, if he doesn't, if his, if his kidney doesn't heal, his career is over. We then get Farouk the Gladiator and Sonny coming well, out. Before we get that, though, we find out that four men are going to fight in a mini battle royal to get a title shot or to get the Intercontinental title. No, no, it was Something. the because ti- Ahmed won a battle royal to yes. get a title shot. And that, uh, so now they had to find out who was going to take that title shot. And then they would do a full tournament on Raw to crown a new Intercontinental champion. Uh, that's some total nonstop action right there. That's uh, a little too complicated for me. Then, as this video package ends, Ahmed Johnson says that he holds no one at fault for what happened to him. Not Farouk. He did not man- hold Farouk accountable here, even though WWF did. This is terrible. This, uh, this was very bad. Uh, then, as you said, here comes Sonny, different gear. So this is the fifth outfit we've seen Sonny in this evening. Uh, totally fine. Totally then, fine. Yeah. Then Farouk comes out in an outfit that is the opposite of totally oh. fine. It is though it is as though Farouk stepped out from the Technicolor film of Ben Hur the movie. He he has this like Centurion looking gear. I, he looks like if you took Ron Simmons and put him in Salvatore Belomo's gear. This is you talk about promotional malpractice. You have Ron Simmons, particularly this vintage of Ron Simmons, and this this is the gear you put him in. This weird plasticky blue helmet. Uh, this, this, so like, weird. Frilly singlet. What in the world was this? This was this was like one step beyond putting dusty roads and yellow black and yellow polka dots. This was uh, this was not good. Who looks at Ron Simmons? After the career Ron Simmons has had up to this point. Former world heavyweight champion. Former world tag team champion. This is a guy who people He's a known guy. People know this guy. And you say, no, no, modern day gladiator. That's what I see here. Get yourself a a wacky foam helmet, sir. (laughs) Sonny calls him her little special modern day 
Roman Gladiator. He's done. He is dead here until they until they they repackage him. He he's Farouk. He's the Nation of Domination guy. Uh, but at this point, at this moment in time, he is six feet under, buried by this gimmick before he even gets a chance. Yeah, horrible. He says he wants the Intercontinental Title. Sonny says he'll win the tournament. What Sonny wants, Sonny gets, and she wants the gold. We then get a recap of Jerry the King Lawler making fun of Jake Roberts' alcohol and drug problems. This show sucks at this point. An awful professional wrestling show. I, I'm sorry, but I'm 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 revisiting just the experience I had watching this and taking notes on this show. I was excited about this coming in, thinking, oh, maybe we're gonna get a good Bret Hart match. We're gonna get a good uh good Steve Austin, early Stone Cold Steve Austin match, and instead this is the type of stuff we're getting. Uh, yeah, this video package with uh, with Jake and Jerry Lawler. We see Lawler over and over taunting Jake about his real-life alcohol and drug addiction. Jake puts a snake on Lawler. That's how the video package ends. Jake literally, he says, he's talking about wanting to die. Like, this is a very, very serious uh promo that he's giving which is just real life and behind it we have like the may young uh fabulous moolah rock and roll stock music this is so weird such a strange presentation we go from there and we it's fresh from representing the u.s at the olympics here comes mark henry howard finkel introduces the newest wwf signing the world's strongest man mark henry Yes, that Mark Henry in 1996. And I'm like, man, did Mark Henry have a long career? Yes. Wow. And they signed him at this point to like a 10-year contract. Yes, 10-year, big money. He is wearing an all-white leather suit, which is incredible. Mark Henry, not many men could pull this off. He does. And as in modern days, we're getting Mark Henry on commentary. That's right. He, he joins a crowded booth of four men. I just, uh, as in modern days, I will say, I hope Mark Henry did not get paid by the word, because if so, he's not making much money. He does not say much when he's on commentary. So Lawler comes out with a bag that looks like Jake the Snake's snake bag. Um, he's got bottles in his pockets. He's got two bottles of Jim Beam for him makes fun of Jake's wife. Then he starts making fun of Mark Henry for not winning a gold medal. Well, how about when he's making fun of Jake's wife, Vince and Mark Henry are cracking up. <laughs> this is Vince McMahon, baby face commentator at this point. still, <laughs> and Mark Henry conquering Olympic hero. And they're laughing at Jerry Lawler, making fun of the real life addiction of Jake Roberts and making fun of Jake Roberts wife. At this point, I noticed the referee is Harvey Whippleman. <laughs> yes, Harvey <laughs> Whippleman, including wearing his glasses. Uh, I I did not expect that. I had no recollection of Harvey Whippleman no. as a referee. <laughs> Here comes Jake, the great Jake the Snake music. He's wearing his old gear, but he's clearly put on a lot of weight. So he's got this sort of like weird shirt thing that's not really covering up his body, but kind of covering up his body. Lawler pulls a giant bottle of champagne out of his bag. <laughs> this bottle of champagne, it's <laughs> as if King Kong himself had a two scale bottle of champagne. That's what this is. Jake pulls the snake out of his bag and puts it on Lawler. Lawler runs away. Jake and then and Harvey Whippleman put the snake back in the bag. I love referees not <laughs> yes. afraid of snakes we've seen over yes. Jake's career. The snake, by the way, is named Revelations at this point uh, because Jake is born again. Finally, Jake starts attacking him, slams him on the floor, posts him. Lawler then throws a fan's drink in Jake's face. Then Jake gets tied in the ropes, and Lawler, with the bottle in the ring, Goes after him, but Jake is free. Hits a short arm clothesline. The crowd desperately wants a DDT at this point. Jake is probably second or third on this show so far as most over guys. Oh, for sure. And he is so far from his peak. He's so far from uh, the peak of his push in the, WWF, in the WWF, but these people love him. 
Lawler grabs the ref to stop the DDT. Lawler then grabs the bottle and hits Jake in the throat with it. He pulls the tights and gets the pin. Jerry Lawler pinning Jake the Snake. He says, he then gets on the mic and says, something's wrong with Jake's throat. He just needs a drink. He then pours the Jim Beam into Jake's mouth, pouring it all over him. Mark Henry has seen enough, goes over, grabs Lawler's arm as Lawler then runs away. Henry helps Jake the Snake to the back. This was a very long four minutes and seven seconds. You're lying. This was only four minutes and seven <laughs> yes. seconds. The match this time. The match time. Horrible. This was an all-time bad WWF pay-per-view segment. Uh, Jim Ross says, as this concludes, that wasn't an athletic contest we just witnessed, and JR, right again. All right. So now this show has been not good. <laughs> Oh, it has been, been, you are being very, bad. It has been very bad. It has been very bad leading up to this. Awful. This so. is, to this point, one of the worst pay-per-views that we've reviewed on this podcast by a significant margin. I, I'm honestly struggling to think of many that weren't as bad, if not worse, than this. Uh, Bash of the Beach 2000. Uh, but y- you don't want to be in that company. <laughs> no, you don't. So, But this was sold as a two-match show. So you've got your two main events here. Boiler Room match in the championship coming up here so it's we get a recap of the undertaker and mankind feud and this leads to the boiler room brawl undertaker versus mankind paul bearer comes out with the urn because again to win the match you need to fight from the boiler room to the ring whoever takes possession of the urn in the ring wins so again this is a race race. it's a race this is (laughs) <laughs> there is no point to actually try to do damage to your opponent. The only thing it's to do is to run faster than your opponent. The taker um, can't stop slaying monsters, though. That's just what he's going to do. He's right, the light. He's the has... light in a world of darkness <laughs> in the new American city of Cleveland, Ohio. So, so uh, this Undertaker's bell tolls. Paul Bearer brings the urn to ringside. And again, as you said, we learn the rules of the match. We then get uh this dramatic shot of the undertaker and this is still in his purple gloves and purple boots era slowly walking down the hallway he reaches the end of the hallway and he goes to open a door that says boiler room danger Uh, but he waits he hesitates he, he considers he then opens the door and this is where i note that even though we have announcers this is in fact the first cinematic match in pro wrestling history that it is there are no commentators there's no fan reaction well you we don't... do have commentators they, they lay out for the most part but they do pop in here and there later there will be a point where they pop back in for ooh, oh yeah <laughs> but that's about but also it early they do like they're they're in the boiler room and you get commentary of, oh takers looking under this pipe but mankind isn't there <laughs> It's uh, it's it, it's so, yeah. He he basically is inspecting the boiler room as though he's with OSHA. He's uh, he's getting low. He's creeping around, <laughs> peering behind corners. Uh, he, he's cautiously now walking around a more open part of the boiler room. Still can't find mankind, and he's almost he's almost like he's scared. Uh, which I guess you know he, he's he's not a monster. He's a monster slayer, so he's got a healthy dose of fear of the monster. Mankind from behind hits Undertaker with a piece of wood. So you can flip that OSHA sign to zero days since our last <laughs> yes, incident. Exactly. He breaks off a piece of wood from a nearby pallet and hits Taker with that. He's beating him down. Taker fights back. Mankind's able to clothesline Taker across like a wooden horse. Not not the animal, but the, the woodworking equipment. A sawhorse, if you will. And by yes. the way, pallet-based offense in wrestling... Uh, it terrifies me because as someone who worked in a grocery store for seven years through, uh, through last couple of years of high school and through college, those pallets, those are nasty just for the, from the, uh, the splinters alone, <laughs> splinters alone. Like I, I mean, hit me with a chair, hit me with a garbage can, hit me with one of these pipes, anything, but one of these pallets, no commentary again, like we mentioned, just the occasional, Oh gosh, when someone gets rammed into something. We lose a camera. It just... We lose a camera, but that's all. The camera loss is 100% planned Fake. here because yeah. it's, 
it like the the feed cuts out and it gets fuzzy but it's done in a way that it looks fake like if you know what stuff actually looks like when you lose a feed clearly this was just for them to go to a different spot and set up or set up something that they couldn't do without having uh like moving into a different place like it was a creative way to get around it yes but it, it was still pretty obvious Taker knocks over noisy pipes, which is always an easy <laughs> hardcore wrestling yes. move. It doesn't yeah. hurt at all. makes a ton of noise. Yes. Always great to see. Uh, trash can shots to Taker. Mankind holding a trash can as Taker hits it with a pipe, pushing it back. The can goes right into Mankind's face. Mankind lets out some steam out of a pipe into Taker's face. At, Ta- at this point, they're crawling slowly on the floor and... As someone who had never seen this match in full, uh, but had seen clips and had heard people talk about how unique and great this was, at this point, my take on this is that this sucks. It is slow, but it's also... Given who is in this, given this is a blood feud with peak Undertaker and peak Mick Foley Mankind, this is... I don't know. Maybe this is a hot take, but I was not feeling this at all all again because i this is it's slow it's plotting and then still the race has to happen yeah we saw undertaker have a better hardcore match with rob van dam than we did here with mankind yes a (laughs) hidden gem if there ever was one on that uh what was that was that vengeance Vengeance 2002 2002. yeah so you get uh we see taker's elbows bleeding and Mankind hits Taker with low blows using a plastic tube. This and... is where we learn that dead men still can take uh, <laughs> feel pain when they get hit in the groin. That they can. And Undertaker, again, does a great job knocking over noisy metal pipes. <laughs> yes, he's trying to get up. There's a bunch of uh, pipes sort of affixed to the wall. I by saw him like, knock those over. Knock those over. That's good <laughs> yes. hardcore wrestling. And, and he it, did. Yes, uh, that, uh, that gets me back into it. The sounds. Uh, Then it it picks up a little bit because we have a garage door. Mankind throws Taker into this garage door and then just hits a huge running knee, starts screaming and squealing. And I would have been totally fine with how devastating this looked if this put the Undertaker out. But this looked brutal, made a great sound, but was so it it was super safe. And and so I loved everything about this move. Mankind is such a great brawler here, though. Uh, For sure. Watching him. Uh, with no noise, right? Again, there's no commentary. There's no crowd noise. So he's making a ton of noise, and it's adding to the ambiance of the match. Like I yeah, could so imagine screaming. if this was just groans of those two guys throwing punches. <laughs> like He's screaming. He's squealing. He's doing all of his mankind of rhythms. His, and... un- his sort of unintelligible words or syllables as he throws punches or just is, is crawling. Um He's in some ways he's mankind, but he's his most like 1995 ECW Cactus yes. Jack uh, in so. mankind garb in this match. And so, yes, as this goes along and we get more of, of Mick Foley just doing a Cactus Jack mankind tour to force, uh, I'm starting to enjoy this more and it starts to, to pick up a little bit. Takers down on the concrete, concrete floor, and mankind climbs a ladder. And drops an elbow onto Taker on said concrete floor. Yes, think Brutal. of the, the running elbow drop that, that Cactus Jack would do off the apron onto the concrete floor, uh, you know, in WCW quite a bit. And then think of that three times as high. We get a fake camera cut feed. We lose the feed again in fake fashion. It lasts longer. The fans are booing. We can hear. Uh, you know, Undertaker <laughs> grunting and mankind doing screaming and squealing in the background. And this is where I note, wow, this is like a, a tribute, an homage to Scramble Vision. And then I wonder <laughs> when I was listening to this show on Scramble Vision for real, then on the screen, if you're ordering it, they had a fake Scramble Vision. This is it's really meta. It's like Scramble Vision inception for me as I was watching this, uh, trying to watch this as a kid. Pictures back, we get Mankind setting up a ladder, and it's a scary wood ladder leaning yes. against a wall. This isn't like wrestling metal ladders. A terrifying wood ladder leaning against a wall, and he this climbs like, like, the top of it. The scenery feels like something out of like the old Resident Evil video games at this point. 
Taker then tips the ladder back, and mankind lands on cardboard boxes and this, pallets. Damn it! It Not did. Good. There's no crash pad here. No. Maybe a thin mat at best underneath one of these cardboard boxes, but this was a terrifying fall for mankind. He did not get the Shane McMahon treatment when it came to crash pads no. here by any stretch. And while obviously his falls that he took a couple years later uh, off the, the top of the cage and hell in the cell were horrific uh, and were worse than this, these are still really, really, really scary to see. Mankind hits Taker in the knee with a chain. Taker then sprays Mankind with a fire extinguisher. But Mankind... They're by the door at this point. They're, they're crawling toward the door, if I remember correctly. Yes, the Mankind gets out the door. Yeah, to get out of the, yeah, yeah, get out the, the boiler first. room and get to the hallway that then leads to the locker room, which then leads to the ring. Yeah, so Mankind's out the door first. He's trying to slam the door on the arm of Undertaker. Eventually... Foley makes it through another door and he starts barricading that door. Well, he does. He barricades the door with everything he can find desks and chairs and tables. But then after he barricades the door, he just stands there and waits for Taker to come through the door. Isn't the whole point of barricading it so that you can get away, get closer to the ring, win this? No, it's race not like it's a race. Iron? Oh, wait. No, it is. Wait. It, it is literally a race. Uh, Taker predictably explodes through the door uh they brawl they brawl taker chokes mankind and throws him into a box of light tubes oh my gosh this was uh, so he like he death match him. style light tubes here in this wwf show in 1996 underrated fall here where undertaker grabs him by the throat and throws him into like a big plastic garbage can yes. and and mankind does an awesome fall there Mankind grabs a giant tub of coffee and dumps it on The Undertaker. Mankind is the first to make it out toward the ring. Taker comes running out of the entryway with a clothesline. And then they fight their way to the ring. But we should note, by the way, our only only very, very short viewing uh, appearance of Stone Cold, Stone Cold Steve Austin on this entire pay-per-view is we see him for like a half a second in the hallway as they're brawling back to where the ring. That's it. Mankind pulls the mats back, exposing the floor. Mankind hits the lazy man's pile driver on the exposed floor. It is a short pile driver. It is the shortest pile driver you've ever seen. Usually I enjoy the short pile driver, you kind of just pull the guy up by by his tights and yeah, you pull the, stuff you, him down. You pull the guy up by his tights as you're falling backward. That's why yeah. it's the lazy man pile driver. This I will give you. This actually came off like <laughs> the lazy man's pile driver. Uh, but at this point, again, I know this is now like the TNA reverse battle royal. Whoever gets in first wins. <laughs> Mankind... Also, we should note from a, a, a presentation standpoint, and it's sort of a sign of the times. So, again... This is 1996. The majority of this match, the last 15 minutes of this match, have taken place backstage. Are they showing the video on the big screen in the (laughs) arena? No. (laughs) No. What do they have? They have four big, huge, you know, the old style CRT monitors. Yes, that are like 5,000 pounds. Basically, it's like, remember in school when they'd wheel in the cart and you'd watch, you'd have a substitute and just watch a movie. And it'd be this old style TV on a cart. They have one of those on each side of the ring that I guess like (laughs) the first 15 rows of fans can see. I'm guessing somebody way up in the nosebleeds of this 17,000 seat arena. They're not going to be able to make much out from this standard definition TV at ringside. Both men on the apron. Taker yanks the top rope back and mankind falls back first onto the concrete. A sick thud and it reminded me of when cactus jack versus mil mascaris yes at the clash of the champions (laughs) where cactus does the same spot and jim Cornette on commentary was screaming cactus jack is dead and that (laughs) that is 
burned into my brain from childhood. It was probably the most brutal thing I saw in wrestling, and it was burned into my brain. And and this was just as brutal as well. It took me right back to that moment. Yes, I uh, we are cut from the same cloth because I wrote <laughs> that down as well as I saw this uh, nasty plunge of the concrete. Oh bleep. This is like the Mill Masker match. <laughs> is what it says in all caps in my notes right now. Taker in the ring on one knee asking for the urn from Paul Bear. Paul turns his back on Taker. Mankind gets in the ring, puts on the mandible claw. Taker's out, except he does the zombie sit up. So Mankind slaps on the mandible claw again. Taker is out. Paul Bear slaps Taker, kicks him. Taker's crawling over to Paul Bear, and Paul hits him in the head with the urn. He waffled him with this urn. Paul Bear gives the urn to Mankind for the victory. 26 minutes and 20 seconds. The famous betrayal of Paul Bear on The Undertaker. The, the first part of the match, you mentioned was the first cinematic match. The first part of the match was taped the previous day. The rest of the segment, so from the point where Undertaker came busting through the barricaded door, that was done live. The rest of it was taped the previous day. Oh, wow. So everything... So what happened backstage as far as, like, in the hallway where the locker rooms are, that was live. Yes. Everything else was taped the previous day. We should also mention, I loved hearing... The tranquil piano uh, heavy exit music, <laughs> exit music of mankind. I loved that. How we had the different exit music that was so, it was disturbing and how peaceful it was given what mankind was as a character and what he was most often doing in the ring at that time. Now they leave. Then Undertaker's uh, bell tolls. Druids. Again. Yes. We get some <laughs> weird chanting that goes on forever. An army of 20 druids come out. Two of the druids pick up Undertaker's ostensibly lifeless body, and then they carry him out as though he is Jesus Christ on the cross or something. The bell tolls. This ends. This that was it. Just weird, weird thing. It was one step uh, removed from. I was at the Royal Rumble '94 where Yokozuna killed the Undertaker, and then his spirit rose up through the video screen and up into <laughs> the. Uh, into the ceiling of the building. I have not this seen was, that. <laughs> this was some wacky stuff. Maybe the uh, the randomizer will give us that. That uh, Shh, don't say it right. too loud. The randomizer. I, I watched that at a, <laughs> at a friend's house, and that was uh, that was a weird one for sure. Uh, but yeah, it this it started off really really slow uh, as far as the the back or the uh, the boiler room brawl part of this match. Uh, But the last five minutes or so of them brawling back there was awesome. Uh, You talked about mankind really, uh, really dialing up the, uh, the cactus Jack parts of the character here. And, uh, and yeah, this was long though. 26 minutes. Doc Hendricks interviews Jim Cornette and Vader. They don't say much. (laughs) Yeah. Jim Cornette starts talking about Peter Frampton for some reason. (laughs) Yeah. Timely. Timely. That was, that was not timely in 1996. (laughs) That was a 20 year old reference. No, definitely. (laughs) Definitely WWF championship. Your challenger, Vader, with Jim Cornette come out first. The man they call Vader, as we are told over and over and over again, including by Howard Finkel uh, on ring announcing. JR says, if Sean takes this match past 30 minutes, <laughs> he'll have the advantage. <laughs> I, uh, I'll take I, I think, the under on this one. Yes. Well, it, it, as as one of, if not the biggest fans of Big Van Vader, uh, I don't say this lightly, but I think particularly given his hour of shadow boxing backstage, <laughs> I think the cardio would probably start to give out before 30 minutes in. Yeah. Uh, perfect says there's no chance Vader doesn't win. Uh, Vader is throwing the steps around on the outside, looking more intimidating than he usually does in the WWF. Meanwhile, Vince is screaming about sports entertainment and the new generation. I don't, I, I just kind of shut my brain off as I kept hearing that over and over again. Out next, the champion, Shawn Michaels, in all of his glory, big entrance, super popular. He's out there with his mentor, Jose Lothario. <laughs> the, the combination of these two men we've talked about before. And yes, obviously, there is the background, the history with the two of them legitimately. But you have Shawn Michaels looking impossibly ridiculous <laughs> trying to describe him with this no. leather beret and the chain mail vest. 
and the sunglasses. And then there's Jose Lothario looking like uh, like a 60-year-old tax preparer. Uh, it is such an odd visual combination. Speaking of odd visuals, how about the fan that gets over the rail and kisses Shawn Michaels? And a then, woman like, jumped the barricade and kisses him in the entryway. What? And then there's this weird split second or this weird moment that it's only a couple seconds, but it feels like a lifetime where she gets over the rail, she kisses him. Sean's like, oh, that was weird. And then time stops for all of them. Like she's accomplished her goal. She expected to, I'm sure, to be grabbed by security. That hasn't happened yet. Sean is expecting the security to be there. That hasn't happened yet. <laughs> and they all just sort of stand there for a moment together. Vince makes a comment about like where's security. security. It's, it's, it was like a Saved by the Bell Zach Morris timeout or something. It was bizarre. When Shawn Michaels was chaining up his mirrored <laughs> leather outfit, do you think Jose Lothario was telling him about the time that he took on Ernie Ladd for the Bare Knuckles <laughs> Championship? I think so. He might have been saying, you, you need to bring that same brawling style to this match with Vader uh, that, that I brought to the Bare Knuckle match in 1983. Uh, with one big in, cat, Ernie Ladd. It's in the back catalog of this podcast. We reviewed that. Go back and listen to that if you don't know what we're talking about. Absolutely. We no should note, by the way, and you may be surprised, and I say that tongue planted firmly in cheek, Shawn Michaels is more over than anyone else we've seen on this show so far. While you are correct, everyone in the building is very excited to see Shawn Michaels. Nobody is more excited about Shawn Michaels coming out than Vince McMahon is. <laughs> this guy loses his mind for Shawn Michaels coming oh, out. What an entrance. Well, yeah, it, Nobody, there's never been a bigger fan of Shawn Michaels than Vince McMahon, and that is on full, full display here. Uh, before the match starts, I always love uh, Vader, large, you know, uh, powerful, but not particularly chiseled man doing the double bicep and taunting the crowd. Always a big <laughs> fan of that. I used to love in WCW when he would do that. And, uh, and Jesse Ventura's reaction. Uh, he's not too cut. The form isn't great, but the power's there. Match is underway. Big body shots by Vader. Short clothesline. Michaels catches the foot of Vader, does a leg sweep. Then the seated Vader gets hit with a drop kick. Yeah, this was really cool and different. Uh, I liked, uh, I did like the beginning of this. It actually did remind me uh, in some ways of Vader versus Sting, which is, we've talked about it before, even though we haven't reviewed that show yet on this podcast. Uh, Great American Bash 92, for my money, the perfect uh, a big bully versus uh, valiant babyface match. And one of the things that made that match so great was that Sting had to bust out moves he had never done in his career before to try to somehow figure out a way to get advantage over Vader. And I liked seeing that from Michaels here early uh, with some of the moves that you mentioned. I guess the only difference is that for large portions of the beginning of this match, Vader, who's supposed to be in theory, although he was rarely presented this way in the WWF, he's supposed to be like the toughest, most intimidating, physically imposing guy. And Michaels just keeps getting the advantage on him over and over and over again. Like it's, it's like the way a lot of Southern tag formula matches will start where, you know, the midnight express for a good five, six minutes at the start of a match, keep uh, slipping up and uh, losing the advantage and keep not being on the advantage against the rock and roll express. It's like that here in a singles match, but it's just, it's weird to see that with Vader being the guy falling prey to these things over and over again. Michaels throws some weak kicks, but yes. then some great punches. Vader tries to throw Sean over the top, but Sean drops to his stomach and wrestling physics carries Vader up and over the <laughs> top rope to the outside. Michaels then, with a huge dive over the top to the outside, wipes out Vader. Michaels slides under the bottom rope between Cornette and Vader, Cornette then screams, runs away, and he punches Vader and sends him back inside. Michaels leaps to the top rope, hits a double axe off the top rope, and then we get a Rana by Michaels. He's totally dominating Vader at this point. If you're wondering, like, he's on did fire. We, 
did we leave out the points where Vader hit a move or tried to hit a move? No. This is Shawn Michaels completely and utterly dominating Vader. Correct. Uh, Michaels then gets up on the shoulders of Vader, victory roll style, takes uh, takes Vader out to the floor, skins the cat yeah, back They in. both go over the top rope. Vader yes. to the floor. Michaels skins the cat back into the ring. Yes, holds on. Ricky Steamboat style, skins the cat back in. Goes for a slingshot Rana over the top rope to the floor. Vader catches him, power bombs Shawn Michaels on the floor. And this is where I note you can just hear in Vince McMahon's voice how not into Vader he is. No, I did like to when he does this slingshot Rana attempt, Vince calls it a Frankensteiner in yes. 1996, which uh, I, I thought was interesting. Then, yeah, I mean, other, anything other than what a maneuver is interesting. <laughs> Vader puts Michaels over his shoulder, walks up the stairs with him, then dumps him over the top rope into the ring. This is also where I noted that Vince was like not impressed by Vader. I think Vince had it in his mind that Vader was going to do something, and then he just dumped him in, and Vader's, or, or Vince is like, oh, I well, guess he just dumped him in. Vader comes in, lays in big shots in the corner, huge forearms. Michaels goes upside down into the buckles, then fired into the other buckles. He goes up and over the top to the floor. How about that beautiful vertical suplex just before that, though, by Vader? Uh, sort of kicking his legs out as he suplexes him. It almost reminded me of, again, if you go back to uh, to our Tuesday Night in Texas review uh, on the on the bonus content uh, via Patreon or Apple Podcasts, uh, when we talked about Bret Hart doing that great vertical yes. suplex against Skinner where – he really puts his legs into it, really making it look like if a suplex is real, that you would have to do that to generate the power and force to get the guy up and over. Vader does something very similar here, and I, I was very impressed by that. Back inside, Vader hits a big backdrop and does his Vader dance, which I always <laughs> love. Yes. Jim Cornette is so happy outside the ring watching Vader destroy Shawn Michaels. It is weird though, because again, like while Vader now is in control, this still it Vader in the WWF, it never felt like his style of match or his comfort zone or the way he worked as a heel dominating. There's just something about the structure of the match and the way he's presented that he feels so much less met, uh, menacing and threatening than he would in any other promotion or any other time in his career. Michaels fights back, but a thumb to the eye stops him. Vader misses an avalanche, but Vader comes out of the corner and murders Sean with a clothesline. <laughs> that made me happy. That was the Vader That's that Vader. I knew and loved. Yes. That's Vader, not the thumb in the eye that no. you mentioned earlier. <laughs> this clothesline well, was first, the, the... no selling a miss of an avalanche in the corner and instead yes. just murdering Michaels with the clothesline. Exactly. We got a brief window into who Vader actually was as a wrestler. Uh, but uh, Sean flips out of a back suplex attempt, hits several punches. Uh, he, he goes over the top, tries to skin the cat again. This time, though, Vader stops him. <laughs> this is awesome. He just picks him up and throws him down hard to the mat, almost F5 style. I love this. Yeah, this was great. He's He just he grabs him, grabs Vader with his legs, and Vader just carries he doesn't go over just walks over and just spins sean off throwing him into the air we get a head and arm choke by vader this was weird it was like a half abdominal stretch half bear hug thing the only person i've seen do this move is actually in more modern times the great okan of all people in new japan pro wrestling uh uses this move and calls it the sheep killer here uh vader is using it and also i noted that there's a 10-year-old in the, in the front row that is not a fan, gives Vader the finger in full view <laughs> next to his parents. Uh, also, at this point, Sean or uh, Vince McMahon is talking about Shawn Michaels feeling the power of the click. And this is where I remember that, oh, yes, before uh, the phrase the click had gotten out to be, you know, the, the backstage term uh, to talk about Shawn Michaels and Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. That the click is what they called Shawn Michaels fans. 
Almost as cool as the testicles for test. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> the crowd is trying to will Shawn Michaels back. But uh, Michaels, he's able to fight out. He tries to go under Vader, but Vader tries a northern exposure. Yes. Where he standing, drops down ass first onto Michaels. A short northern exposure, as we like to call it. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, Sean hits a low blow and a big clothesline and knocks Vader down. Michaels to the top. Oh, goes God. For, the f- for the elbow drop off the top but changes his mind midway through this move, lands on his feet, starts kicking Vader. He's yelling at him. He's I'm not sure what he said. This was so weird. This was extremely weird. This was the height of Shawn Michaels being mad about everything and everyone. I don't know if like Vader slightly moved as Shawn was in the air going for the elbow drop, and I don't know if that's what pissed Shawn off. But yeah, he he instead of hitting the elbow drop, stops, stomps Vader, kicks him several times, spits at him. He he's bad mouthing him. They get up and then they're they're talking to each other, like clearly yelling at each other as they're going into the next spot. Uh, Michaels hits a to, cross. To me, Sorry, no, I was just gonna think like to me the way the rest of this match goes, and how many flying elbows we get later in this match. I feel like almost Michaels got crossed up and wasn't going to be going for an elbow here. Uh, something I, I don't think so because this scene, I mean, this for all the world came off like Michaels being mad that he thought Vader did something that he didn't want Vader to do. And then just, Oh no, the totally that's how it came off. But I like, it, it was just a weird spot to do a flying elbow here anyway, when you're going to do a bazillion of them later I, yeah. or the bazillion later was in reaction to this one. I don't know. I it think was... that's the more likely scenario because yeah, this, super this, weird. This was a Shawn Michaels fit that was thrown. This was <laughs> yes. a, a tantrum uh, that continued throughout the match. Michaels hits this awesome flying cross body that sends both he and Vader up and over the top rope to the floor. And then Sean lands on the floor and then immediately takes a swipe, like throws a punch at the cameraman. Yes, yeah, so weird. Outside, Vader presses Sean over his head, drops him across the barricade. Vader gets back in the ring and wins by countout. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Match is over. Vader wins by countout. Cornette gets on the mic. He says, we don't want it like that. He says, we want the title. Get back inside. Michael starts walking to the back. Cornette calls him gutless. And then Michaels goes, uh, I'll go, yeah. And then he goes back and the match is restarted. It is. I did like, I don't even know if they intended for this to be this way. But this is a callback to three years earlier at SummerSlam where Lex Luger Luger defeated Yokozuna in the WWF title match, the main event of the pay-per-view. But it was inexplicably by countout. And so Lex Luger did not win the championship and his career in the WWF never recovered. Uh, This felt like a a callback to three years earlier at the same event. Uh, But yes, the match restarts uh, and and Vader is, uh, he has Vader immediately jumps Sean on the floor. Cornette hits Michaels with the tennis racket back in the ring. We get an avalanche, an awesome belly to belly suplex by Vader which I don't ever recall Vader using before. That was very was, cool to see him do here. And it was very well executed. Yes. Vader goes for the power bomb, but Sean fights out. He Sean goes as fast as he can and then hits the flying forearm, does a kip up, hits the elbow off the top. The place is going bonkers nuts for this comeback. Cornette then grabs the leg of Sean as he's tuning up the band for Sweet Chin Music. Sean grabs Cornette, but as he does, he throws the tennis racket into the ring. Michael starts attacking Vader with the tennis racket, and the bell rings. Michael's disqualified. Michael beats up Cornette with the racket. Your winner by disqualification for the second time in this match is Vader. But (laughs) Cornette's on the mic again. He there, says, yes, you got more. disqualified on purpose because you're a gutless coward. Restart the match. Let's have a winner, he says. This time, Gorilla Monsoon is out now. 
He says restart it, and here we go again. It's for the third time, Vader versus Shawn Michaels for the WWF Championship. Shawn goes for a sunset flip. Vader, again, does not connect with our Northern Exposure. This time, he doesn't get low blowed. He's at least able to go for it, but he misses. Uh, Shawn hits another flying forearm, hits another top rope elbow. He starts tuning up the band and hits the super kick. But Vader kicked out of Sweet Chin Music. Wow, I did In not expect that. Unbelievable. This isn't, this isn't like Michaels versus Undertaker or Michaels versus no. Kurt Angle, you know, in the 2000s, where at that point, you know, it was, you had to, you know, everyone was finishers kicking out of were, everyone's finishers. They were you had finishers. To hit it, yeah, you had to, had to hit it four or five times before you got the win. This was at the point to where Super Kick was as good as gold. Sean sent off the ropes, hits the ref inadvertently. Vader then hits the power bomb. No referee. Visual pin. Another ref is in, counts two, and Michaels kicks out. Vader then drags Michaels to the corner. He's going to go for the Vader bomb. But Cornette says, no, go to the top. Vader goes to the top. He tries a moonsault, but misses Michaels to the top rope. He hits a moonsault and gets the three count still. WWF champion Shawn Michaels, even though he lost two out of the three falls. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. We uh, should mention, by the way, Vader hitting the moonsault or going for the moonsault, I should say, in the WWF. Very, very rare. I don't oh, recall. Yes. I don't recall him ever doing that in the WWF other than in this match. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, usually it was just it was the Vader bomb splash off the second rope in the corner. That was his finisher more so than the power bomb. Uh, also, we should note that the finish that the Shawn Michaels moonsault was, it was of the standing variety in that Vader was standing. Uh, Michaels hits the moonsault to a standing Vader and gets the pin. All right. Do you have another favorite thing on this show besides Mr. Perfect uh, blowing off a fan? It would have been <laughs> Vader. No selling the miss of the avalanche in the corner and, the and then clothesline. the clothesline. hundred percent. Honestly, the only thing about this match that I liked, I know we talked about it before we started recording. You really liked this match. I did. It, it made me angry and not because of the three restarts. I thought that it, it was far more of a mess than it should have been. You could tell how unprofessional Shawn Michaels was at that point and how much Shawn Michaels sole motivation in a match was Shawn Michaels looking good in 1996. If, uh, if Sean at this point, quite frankly, wasn't so much of an asshole, he and Vader could have had an all time great match because uh, their styles mesh perfectly uh, in terms of the big man, the little man, the high flying. Again, this should have been Vader versus Sting, but exponentially better because how, how much better of a wrestler Shawn Michaels was in 1996 than Sting was in 1992, but his own ego and, and everything else couldn't allow that to happen. So what we had instead was Shawn Michaels dominating the majority of this match, being unprofessional for portions of it, and then winning. Agreed. But looking at what, not what could have been, but what actually happened, seeing Shawn Michaels on offense for a ton of the match means usually good stuff, especially with Vader giving him what he gave him. Uh, I could watch Shawn Michaels do Shawn Michaels things uh, in the ring. Super talent. Like I mentioned, great punches. He had some crazy dives, busted out some Rana's on Vader. This was uh, uh, this was good stuff from Shawn. It was while the Shawn Michaels tour to force, but the problem is that's not what the match called for at all. But but that's what he did. I have no problem with Shawn Michaels doing this if he's in there with Adam Bomb. Huh? But if he's in here sure. with Vader, <laughs> it's it just it, it killed Vader dead. Regardless of the visual pen, visual pin, any of that, it was the start really of the beginning of the end of Vader in the WWF. And just as someone who who you know, Vader's one of my all time favorite wrestlers, and I've always looked at his run in WWF as one of the uh, one of the real missed opportunities of my 35 plus years of watching pro wrestling, going back and seeing this, it was just, it was extraordinarily frustrating. Yes. What Shawn Michaels did was very impressive in terms of in a vacuum, the moves that he was doing, but it just, it, I just don't think it was the right match for, for what they needed to do at all. No. And you're right. This, the way that this was done absolutely killed Vader dead in WWF. Not that he potentially had that great of a future 
potentially anyway, based on especially when you hear Vince on commentary in this match. Yeah, it was uh, going to go wrong at some point, but it didn't need to go wrong this early. <laughs> and yes, particularly when you look at what Vader did after his WWF run, when he was even more physically limited and had a great couple years in all Japan in, uh, in 99 and 2000, like he, he was more than capable of being that Vader here but they had no interest in, in letting Vader be Vader in any way, shape, or form, and neither did Shawn Michaels here. He was going to be Shawn Michaels, do a Shawn Michaels match, and Vader was going to look exactly like any other generic big guy would look against Shawn Michaels. Worst thing on this show. There's a lot oh, to choose from. There is a, a lot to choose from. There's a lot to choose from. I am going to say the worst thing on this show was Bart Gunn's performance. Yes, he was, I was going to say the tag match as a whole or the yeah. heat segment uh, oh. with the smoking guns on offense there. Yeah, 100% we're, we're lockstep on that one. Yeah, Bart Gunn, he, terrible performance. Yeah, the worst I've ever seen him, honestly. And he's not a guy who stands out a lot, but usually he's fine. Here he was actively bad and detracting from the match. Uh, really, though, I actually have to amend this because I don't think there can be any argument that the worst thing on the show isn't what Farouk had to wear. Huh? True. That's right. Ron Simmons gear. Oh my God. Horrendous. If Go, you don't know what we're Google talking it about right now, <laughs> look it up. Google Farouk Assad and search till you don't find his nation of domination gear. Instead, find you when you see a blue nerf looking helmet, <laughs> you'll know you're in the right or I guess wrong place. Yeah. So looking at this show, looking at 1996, this was the, opposite of what WCW was at the time. WCW was a great undercard and a lot of bad main events. And also WCW had, this was the the high point of the NWO storyline. This is before they had just killed that dead to where it was just them dominating WCW all the time without them ever getting their heat back. At least at this point, it was in the early stages of this. This was NWO white hot. Right, so the depth of that WCW talent roster on the undercard oh. made for such amazing pay-per-views. And even though the main event left you kind of like, uh, well, okay, another Hogan match. Yeah, it uh, was fine seeing Hogan versus Piper when you saw Dean Malenko versus Rey Mysterio exactly. for 18 minutes earlier in the show. There was nothing like Dean Malenko versus Rey Mysterio here on this show. No, it's the opposite. WWF had no depth at this point. Their undercard, terrible. And with this was a, so they had to load up every, the only star power that they had was in the top two matches. And, and that was it. The rest of this was terrible. The show didn't have uh, Bret Hart on it. And, uh, and didn't have Steve Austin. And Steve on Austin it, was in a dark, dark match. match. So that's, that that's where you were at this point. WC, that's why WCW was where it was. And WWF was where it was at this point uh, for sure. And, uh, with that, we're going to wrap it up. I did want to make mention, we talked about it throughout the show. We have bonus content. We come to you twice a week, once for the free feed, once for the bonus content. Uh, that's available at patreon.com slash wrestling at random, or you can hit the subscribe button in your Apple podcast app. Or if this evergreen content has moved to some new service. It's uh, located behind whatever that paywall is uh, as well. So that that is where we are uh, today. You can get uh, all of those bonus. There's hours and hours of bonus content, stuff that didn't fit into the first three seasons of this podcast. More into- than a full season's worth of bonus content there. So if you've listened to all of season one, season two, you're in season three and you think, man, I need another season right now to listen alongside. It's all there already in the bonus content. Completely different shows from what we've done here on the free feed. Yeah, so go. you can go there right now. Five bucks a month will unlock that entire back catalog of the podcast. And it'll give you all of that additional bonus content. If something's missing, we haven't reviewed a show that you really wish we would talk about. You can sign up at patreon.com slash wrestling at random. You can pick the tier where you can be the randomizer. You pay $10 for the month. You tell us what show you want us to watch. We will watch it for the bonus feed. Then you can bump yourself down to that $5 feed and continue every single month to get that extra bonus content. And we've also got t-shirts, so you can also uh, do the same thing. Bump yourself up. Get yourself a Wrestling at Random t-shirt as well. 
you can also uh, don't tell anybody, but we put the the free feed also on YouTube. Oh my you God! Can... It's the first time you mentioned. It <laughs> I'm going to mention it. <laughs> we have a running. It's it's quite funny actually because you will send me text messages that you get. You will send me text messages. Excuse me of comments we get on the YouTube channel, and it's hilarious because we have. We have a lot of listeners, a lot of subscribers on our YouTube channel. People comment, and yet we have never once mentioned that the show is available on YouTube. We have never said interact with the show on YouTube, yet people find it. They love it. So I don't know how you're finding it, but we do appreciate it. And if you're listening there, thank you. Yeah, we know you're listening. So shout out to the to the YouTubers that are that are listening to the show there as well. Now uh, you can interact with the show at wrestle at random on Twitter. Same for Instagram, facebook.com slash wrestling at random as well. If you don't want to interact via social media, we have an uh, email address, wrestling at random at gmail.com. All of the links I just described, the entire back catalog of this podcast, links to the bonus content, everything is available at the website, wrestling at random.com. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. Adam, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. I don't know if I should say thank you, Randomizer, because this uh, it fills a hole in my 90s wrestling pay-per-view viewing, but I, I don't feel particularly enriched for having seen this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I saw the Boiler and Brawl now, so I guess I can say that. I want to thank everyone for listening, and we'll talk to you again next time. Bye.